I'd like to I'd like to call this public meeting, public hearing to order. Thank you for coming out this evening. Our first um, item is to make sure we have a quorum, which we do. And again, welcome everybody. We have two meetings tonight. The first meeting is a public hearing for the lease and additional appropriations hearings. And then once that is concluded, then we will have our regular school board meeting. So we've called that the public hearing to order. The um, purpose for tonight is to hold a lease hearing, an additional appropriations hearing in conjunction with our proposed early learning center and central office construction project. After the presentation, there will be an opportunity for public comments. And um, so there are cards that people have filled out, but I understand that Jill is working on a piece of paper now because we've run out of cards. But um, at the appropriate time uh, during the hearing, we'll ask each person that wants to speak uh, to limit their comments to three minutes and limit the topic to the proposed project under consideration. Okay, notices for this public hearing, for the lease hearing and additional appropriation hearings, were published um, legally as required June 8th, 2020 in the Hamilton County Recorder and also then on June 10th, 2020 in the Noblesville Times. All right, before, in pursuant with uh, Indiana Code 20-47-3, before a school corporation may enter into a lease agreement with a nonprofit building corporation, the school corporation must conduct a hearing regarding the execution of the proposed lease and whether the rental to be paid to the lesser building corporation under the proposed lease is fair and reasonable rental for the proposed improvements. Okay, that's a mouthful. Uh, before the school corporation can appropriate any dollars, it directly receives as, as bond proceeds, it must conduct a hearing on those proceeds for the additional appropriation of those funds. Okay, so I will begin with um, an overview by Dr. Gray of the project. Good evening, so just a little bit of background about our project for the Early Learning Center and Central Office. So back in 2016-17, if you recall, we had an operating referendum that was renewed in the fall of 2016, and immediately after that, we began to have conversations about some of the needs of our school district. So we, we had had a demographic study done, we had had a comprehensive facility study done, and so we were really trying to plan for the growth and enrollment that not only was already here, but that was also projected through 2027. And so through those focus groups, we talked about what are some of the great things that we're doing as a school district and what are some of those needs that we may have as we plan for the future. And it was really through those conversations that we made a decision that when we went to the capital referendum that they, they were going that those dollars were going to be utilized for the expansions and renovations at the intermediate, the middle, and the high school, and then the additional dollars would be allocated toward the facility study that had been done. Because we made that decision, what that allowed us to do was really think about whether we really needed to have a brand new elementary school in the future or not. Because what we really learned from our demographic study was that the trends in enrollment were primarily through grades 5 through 12 versus our elementary schools. And so we began to put together a long-term plan for the projects in the school district. And many of you may have, be, have been familiar with um, a presentation that we have been doing. We work, we work together with the board to create our Growing the Rockway presentation. And what that does is it lays out for the next five years, not only the projects that, we will be, that will be necessary for the school district, but it also lays out how this will impact our debt structure, our tax rate over the next several years. What this project will also do for us is, right now we currently use about 21 elementary classrooms for early learning programs. Now keep in mind, those are not taxpayer supported programs, those are fee-based programs, which primarily are taken advantage of by our, our teachers and our staff because they're for their children. We would really like the opportunity to be able, in this new, this new construction new facility down the road, to be able to offer opportunities for early learning, perhaps for children who may not otherwise have those opportunities for learning. 
So with this project, um, also in addition, we currently are leasing space uh, for our central office, which is about $120,000 annually. So in being fiscally responsible and thinking about building an early learning center and also a central office at $19 million without needing additional staffing in comparison to building a new elementary school and perhaps even um, we could be on some of our own land or if we would need to purchase land, but a new elementary school being roughly around $30 million and then additional staffing. So in, in taking those things into consideration, and then also really taking into consideration, we wanted to evaluate the location. So the location of the project, we as a board sat down and looked at what are the current pieces of land that we own as a school district, and then what might be some properties that we might want to invest in as a school district. In fact, we um, and had a purchase agreement on some property thinking that that might be a better location, and as it turned out, going through our due diligence process, we realized that the monies that would have been invested in just infrastructure alone would have taken away from the overall cost and investment in the project. Therefore, we've made the decision to move the project to Monon Trail Elementary School property where we do own 10 acres, and that will also then fit into our long-term plan for growing the Rockway. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Um, now we'll hear from Mr. Eric Long, who will, is from Ice Miller to explain how these financing works. Does the microphone here? Very well. Um, it's a pleasure to be before the board administration once again this evening. Again, I'm Eric Wong with the law and Vice Miller, um, who serves as bond counsel to the school corporation. Um, just as a refresher, the reason that we're having a lease hearing this evening is because the lease financing structure is the mechanism for which the bonds will be issued. And just as kind of a refresher, um, when our state was, when our great state was founded 200 years ago, there was a formulaic limit put in for the amount of direct debt that any taxing unit um, can issue. As our state has evolved over the course of 200 years, um, state law has since evolved and the General Assembly saw fit to allow additional funding mechanisms and structures um, for all taxing units, including school corporations, to be able to um, authorize and issue bonds for their projects. And so the lease rental mechanism, the, the lease financing mechanism, is one that's specifically granted to school corporations by state law. Um, and under that structure, a building corporation, in fact, is the issuer of the bonds as opposed to the school corporation. And according to those statutory provisions, the building corporation is required to own the land where the project is going to be constructed. Um, and then through this lease financing structure, they then lease it back to the school corporation for the life of the bond issue, hence the lease hearing. All right, thank you so much. Um, now we'll hear from Mr. Tom Michael on the financing of the project and the tax rate. Yep. So just wanted to go over a couple of meetings we've already had. So February 11th, we had our first kind of hearing and resolutions on this meeting. We had the project resolution and the preliminary determination resolution at that time. Um, at that time, we said the total project cost to be $19 million and then interest rate not to exceed 5%. Also based on our current projections, that's basically $19 million project is roughly 5.8 cents on our tax rate. However, with everything that's going on and the debt falling off, um, we do expect our tax rate to continue to drop as it has the past several years. Actually, in 2020, we have the lowest total tax rate that we've had since um, 2011. So we've had the lowest tax rates in the last nine years, and then also 2020 compared to 2019, our levy is actually lower than last year as well. So our tax rate's going down, and our levy actually went down last year as well when we look at those areas. Um, then at our April 23rd board meeting, we approved the formula lease. So the structure that Eric just described, as well as um, the reauthorization of the building corporation. We've utilized the same building corporation, the same members that we've utilized for the last several projects. Um, and the goal is actually to eventually get everything on one. That way we have one specific body to work with as we work through these items. So um, just wanted to discuss, you know, as Dr. Gray said, this is going along with our Growing Rockway plan. Um, as we look in the future, and those who have seen the Growing Rockway plan, there are other future projects that have been discussed in that plan. So when we discuss that the tax rate is going to continue to decrease, that is with all those projects already factored in as well. Um, so as we look to the future, you know, our tax rate will st still continue to go down even with these projects coming on board. Um, and it's actually going to continue dropping rather rapidly for the next several years as we continue to manage the rate going down. Okay, thank you so much. 
right. I'll entertain a motion to open the public the hearing for public comment. So moved. All right, seconded. Okay, I do have three comment cards, so I'll begin with those, and then Jill can bring me more as we um, have more. Okay, Erica Strong. Check and see. Um, my, just a quick comment. I know that the plan is to move forward with this project, but it seems like with what's going on with COVID, that all plans, you know, vacation plans, wedding plans, lots of things have been interrupted. And I wonder if it makes sense to maybe pull back and wait some time. You know, we don't know what school is gonna look like this year, and we really don't know what it's gonna look like going forward. And I know that there have been children who have been drawn from Westwood Washington schools to go to Sheridan because they want a smaller school experience. I know we've got kids who are going to stay home and do online schooling through Westwood Washington schools. I know that we've got other children who are going to stay home and do a more traditional homeschooling or Indiana online and stuff like that. And then we've got this um, demographic study that says that in 2027, our student population is going to level off and I think begin to decrease. So I worry sometimes that we're going to build too much and then not have uh, the people or programs to fill it. So that was my comments. Thank you. My name is Burr Scalton, 3744 Slipper Rock. I want to thank President Picker and the board, Dr. Gray. I want to first talk about the notice. And we all talk about what's illegal, but a two inch ad buried in a Noblesville and a uh, Hamilton reporter is not good notice. Not when we send out email blasts and the minute the snow blows. So I, I disrespectfully approve this project has been properly noticed and discussed. So the biggest thing I see in this lease is sixty-six million dollars. Okay. So based on a nineteen million dollar project, that's seventeen percent interest that is being made on that lease. That's crazy. And you know, we always hear the, the story like that's dropping off. Well, get it, let it drop off and quit borrowing money. So, I'm asking for three things. We stop all discussion and project movement on this, till three things. We advertise it again specifically so everybody can come in and hear a more detailed explanation. B, we don't do anything until after the budget period of August and September. And quite frankly, we ought to wait till a new school board is seated next January. We have to cut up this project. <laughs> we need to take steps now in anticipation of state and federal cuts in 2021-2023 while eliminating of an operating revenue. I hear you on tax rate. Well, you know what? AV is way up as were our property tax bills that we all pay this week. Stop spending. Cut non-classroom money spending and get back to basic <laughs> Thank you. 
I have a lot of the same concern that Mr. Dalton just talked about, that the number was failed to be mentioned, that over time this is gonna cost $66 million, and yet, as a mom of six kids in Westfield schools, I have seen budget cuts in my kids' classrooms that, in my opinion, hurt their education experience. That is unneeded, it is irresponsible, and should not be happening at all. I also believe in being a team player here in Westfield because that's what Westfield is all about. And I do not believe for one second this is being a team player. When you're talking about early literacy and early learning and you look around at all of our community that support early learning, where we get to take our kids to and have the experience in the community, why then does Westfield need to spend money on this as well? We clearly have enough in the community. And what have we even talked about those individual corporations that are in these small churches and on every corner that do the early learning for our kids? What happens to them? They decrease in numbers, their program falls out. I don't think this is fair one bit to sit here and say, let's build an admin building. When COVID-19 is happening, this absolutely should be put on hold. We don't know what it's going to look like in a month from now, three months from now, a year from now. I am along with Mr. Dalton in saying this needs to be put on hold, that we need to wait to see what school looks like in the future, especially with the global pandemic going on right now. And I also think that the numbers need to be honestly represented, that yes, interest rate might be low, but that's a lot of money that the interest rate's on, and to have the number be 66 million, that seems a little irresponsible to me and not being a team player in Westfield at all whatsoever. Closing the public hearing. Okay, sorry. Now we will move to our regularly scheduled school board meeting. And that, one moment. I will call that meeting to order. We do still have a quorum. And again, thank you for coming out this evening. We always begin our meetings with a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance, if you'd like to join me. This evening. Our agenda this evening is organized into three sections. We have a superintendent's report. The second section is that we have uh, agenda items and report outs. And then the third section is the public comment opportunity. I would like to acknowledge that last month we did rearrange the order of the agenda to allow for the public comment as a courtesy um, the, for the crowd that was there. Um, it was it was not our intent to hide any content of the meeting. As announced, as announced, everybody was welcome to stay for the entire meeting. As a reminder, school board meetings are filmed each and every month and have been for several years. And once they are filmed, we post them for the public on our Westfield Washington website. So this evening, we do have a number of items to review and will maintain the normal agenda of welcoming public comments in the last section of the meeting. If you're interested in speaking, I know people filled out um, comment cards, so thank you. 
and then the board is committed to staying um, this evening as long as necessary to give everybody interested a chance to speak. So again, welcome, and we will start with our superintendent's report. Okay, something that we love to do each school, um, each month at our school board meetings is to recognize the great work that is happening in our schools. And so tonight, I'd like to introduce Mr. Andy Hilton, our principal at Cary Ridge Elementary School, and our assistant principal, Mrs. Buzan. Turn it over to you. Hello, my name is Andy Hilton, like Dr. Greg said, and I'm the principal at Cary Ridge Elementary and this is Tiffany Buzan. We want to thank the board for allowing us to come in today. Um, each year we do try to present on something that you know we're proud of in the school and that our teachers and our kids have been working on a lot um, but this year we thought there's a lot going on with covid and how are we going to keep schools open so the administration staff some teachers some parents and school board has been working on a return of the rocks plan and what we did is take the plan once it was created and then how's that going to work at Cary Ridge. So um, the first thing, oh, I'm going first thing, that's. Good evening, everyone. Um, so on our first slide, we are going to talk about entry into the building and dismissal. So on a typical Cary Ridge morning, you will see the buses pull in and you will see the children dismissed in a large gaggle. And this year, we're gonna do things very differently. So when students arrive, we will dismiss the students by grade level, and every grade level will go into a very specific entry into the building, and then we will also dismiss students the exact same way. So we try to minimize the amount of students that are in the hallway together at the same time. So our bus riders, they're going to come in, they'll have masks on, just as our car riders will. What we've done is we've already looked at our car rider line because we anticipate that we're gonna have some more parents dropping kids off. So we have already lengthened that car line to anticipate for those students who are going to be coming in cars. And we also have a larger space set aside for those students when they come in to wait to the bell rings. And our goal is to keep school open as long as possible. So we know that we have to social distance and wear a mask. And the next slide is if somebody does test positive or if they have symptoms, we have a separate health clinic, so we're not sending kids that might have a headache who could possibly have COVID into a nurse's office where you know we have somebody checking blood sugar or you know something like that. So we do have, we want to isolate them. We want to make sure that we're communicating with the parents. There is an if-then chart that has been created. So if a student you know has a headache and we call the parents and send home, there's certain things we can do. You know, go to a health provider certain amount of time whether we give them you know if you are testing positive you have to have the two weeks things like that so there is an if then chart that we, we have that will help with all that um, we are also going to work with parents as much as we can to try to make sure that they are aware of this information because we don't want anything you know just because my child has a sore throat they have to stay home for two weeks that could be a little overwhelming because at an elementary school we typically have a lot of headaches and sore throats and you know we want to make sure that we're communicating and then what steps we have to do once you know a child does have a sore throat or a fever so that will all be going out to parents Thank you. Um, on our next slide we're going to talk a little bit about what things are going to look like in the classroom so or i'm sorry the cafeteria so um one of the things that we first talked about when we were thinking about coming back to school is the cafeteria. There's so many kids in there at one time. So what we've decided to do, um, our building carry ridge is designed exact, almost exactly the same as this one. We're going to turn this NPR into an additional cafeteria space. So we can then spread the children out as much as possible at tables and between seats. We've also um, scheduled our lunches a little bit differently. So we're going to have 15 minutes between when grade levels eat. So we always try in between due to allergies and um, you know contents on the table to really clean the tables before a new grade level comes in. So this year we're hoping that with the 15 minutes in between, we'll have extra staff in the cafeteria and more time to really go through and disinfect the tables and seats if necessary. We also looked at our traffic flow. So in a building of over 600 children, which Cary Ridge has, 
we have people going everywhere at all different times, going to recess, going to lunch, going to specials. So we looked at when students were leaving lunch, going to recess, going to specials, and we adjusted all the traffic flow so that students should not be running into each other at different grade levels. So if you're going to lunch, you should not be running into a different grade level that's heading out to recess and so forth. And then on the final slide, we're looking at the classroom. So in a typical classroom, let's say third grade, we have 25 students, you know, social distancing is six feet away. And that is difficult to do with, you know, 25 kids, desk, tables, and all that. So we are working on how we can get the kids outside, some as well. So if we can do a lesson outside instead of inside, that way it's going to be a struggle for kids to wear a mask all day. And we want to work with them to try to relieve that so but we have to make sure that we're doing it in a safe way not only do we want to avoid the spread but we also have some students with some health concerns that we want to protect as well so as long as we can do it safely we're going to do what we can to allow kids to take off masks when they're in the classroom we're going to be wearing masks and if a teacher feels that they can social distance in their class which will be tough they can decide they can take their mask off but other than that, we are going to spread out the chairs, the tables, um, as far as we can, get the kids a lot of space, and just try to avoid as much contact. So if somebody does get sick, then that way their exposure for the other students is not as much. So it's a moving scale of you know what's accepted and what they're telling us to do, but we are going to try and keep kids as safe as possible. So thank you. Board had any. But one other thing, um, also with specials, a, if you're an art teacher, you see, you know, every grade. So one teacher from fourth grade, then one teacher from third grade, and then in a single week, you'll have 600 kids through your classroom. So we're trying to provide more time in there for cleaning, and we're also looking at changing the schedule. And maybe if we have instead of a teacher doing all five specials this week, we only do art this week. Next week they do music. We're still trying to figure out how that looks with PE to get kids moving and how we can add some of that into the day. But then that way there's only 125 kids through the art room instead of 600 in a single week. So we thank you for your time. Board, do we have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to piggyback a little bit off of what uh, Mr. Hilton and Mrs. Buzan shared because I'm very proud of the work that our committees have been doing and I think as they alluded to, our plans are very flexible and we must be very nimble because sometimes information is coming to us almost on a daily basis and we need to be able to make adjustments. So what I did want to share, based on the current plan that we had shared out with our, our most recent plan that we've shared with our families, we had put out a survey. We wanted to use this survey information based on the current plan to gather some feedback about what we might be looking at in terms of instruction. And then what I can also share is the three committees that are working are continuing to work at our site, our safety, our operations, and then also our teaching and learning committees. And then each week, I know that I'm in uh, constant contact with the Hamilton County superintendents, and then also we meet with our principals, and then our also our teachers association leadership. And we had a, a very productive meeting again today where we are looking at some additional refinements um, to our plan. So I'll share currently where we are, and then you may be getting some updates um, about our plan that um, we think will also be very helpful to keep our students safe and our staff safe and healthy. So with the current survey that we had put out, and we were asking with that plan, will children be returning to school in August? And so, as of today, we have 8,553 students enrolled, and so 45, 4,501 responses, and so 88% reported returning um, to school, and then uh, virtually about 11% or 504 students, and then um, just 1% that would not be enrolled in Westfield schools. And then we asked, will your child plan to ride the bus this year? And so basically with that, um, with that question, we had 71.1% of our families say that yes, they plan to ride the bus this year, and 29% um, that said that they would not. And then we also asked, would they be starting, would they ride the bus beginning at the very uh, start of the school year? And 67% um, said that they would of, 
of the students who said they were writing. So this information is a starting point for the plan that we currently have in place. And then as I mentioned, we're continuing to update our plans because some of the things that we really want to, to take into consideration is current updates, looking at trends, in positive COVID cases. We also want to minimize, if, if at all possible, the number of students in a classroom or in large spaces, so whether that's the cafeteria or in hallways. And then also, again, we understand that there are differing opinions about um, the use of masks or not wearing masks. And so we just, we also know that face-to-face -face learning is the most important thing for our children, and we want to be able to maximize that time. So you'll be hearing more about updates for our plan. And then also this evening, uh, we have Eli with us and from the Skillman Corporation, and he's going to give us an update on our construction project. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. I'm Eli with the Skillman Corporation. I have to give another construction update. Working on probably 30 months now of this. At Westfield High School, we are reaching the final stretch. Uh, we have another five months of construction left to be completing the project by the end of the uh, 2020 year. I have some several areas we're turning over, uh, start the academic year here in August. And uh, the Westfield Natatorium project, we are a little over two thirds of the way done. That project is on schedule and will be turned over in a year as well. progress at Westfield High School. We'll start with the uh, exterior work. So as you recall, we presented this when we first started the projects uh, some little over two years ago. Uh, the final two phases of the site work, phase one and phase three, will be turned over this summer. So that includes all the sidewalks, curbs, parking areas. You see a lot of activity if you drive by the school right now, a lot of heavy equipment. Yes, we'll be put back together as long as Mother Nature cooperates with us. And as a reminder, weather is a responsibility of the board. <laughs> Our phasing plan, uh, working actively in several areas, the existing band room, the commons area, the facts, culinary arts lab, uh, science classrooms, regular classrooms, and then also the guidance and admin areas that we're turning over this month. Uh, the second floor uh, containing with the uh, core classrooms in each wing and also the uh, science classrooms there in the uh, light green. Progress to date, starting with our new addition on the south side of the building. Uh, we've completed all of the soil stabilization so we'll have a nice long-term durable parking lots. You'll see a lot of the sidewalks are poor. Some of the pictures we have here are a little bit lower, a week old, so there's some, a lot of progress being made. Uh, the exterior of the building is fairly complete. We're down to finishing touches, installing a few uh, parts and pieces that didn't quite fit when they showed up, and then caulking and cleaning. Inside the addition, uh, putting the finishes in, we are painting, completing the flooring, carpet tile, the luxury bottle tile, LBT, lights are installed, all the casework's installed, uh, doors and hardware are installed, and we're pretty well final cleaned out in the new addition. Uh, the east side of the addition, uh, lag a little bit behind the uh, west side. Uh, as you recall, we had uh, some uh, underground obstructions we had to build around, so that caused a little delay, a little lag on the east edition, but uh, that is tracking quite nicely about two weeks behind the west edition. Same sort of uh, items we completed, the flooring, the terrazzo, and the final cleaning. Uh, do have some great pictures of the final products that we'll share later in the presentation. Uh, this is looking uh, to the east. 
Like I said, the site photos are about a, a little over a week old, so a lot of price been made since they've been taken. Uh, quite a few sidewalks and curbs are in place, and we'll be ready to pay them here in about a week, week and a half. Again, with the site work, this is on the east side of the building. Uh, pretty well ready for stone and paving. Uh, this kind of tells the story of our new addition. Uh, it's labeled sidewalks, but uh, you see this, the building, I think it looks great, matches the existing building very nicely. I think the architect did a nice job on that. West addition, some of the interior spaces there, the storefronts in. More progress being made on the exterior of the building. Uh, the production lab, we're really uh, excited to see how this turned out. I think it'd be a good, good addition for the for the uh, trades at Westville High School. Uh, the existing for the new addition band area and the locker storage you see there for the band equipment and there's a large band storage room uh, in the back and the foreground there. All the new uh, kitchen equipment and the new addition. Sure, very pressing uh, areas are the guidance and admin areas. Those are still to be turned over here in the this month, this July. Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, concern about those areas being ready for school since uh, they'll be heavily utilized. But yes, they will be turned over. Uh, progress to date inside the existing school. So first we focus on the addition. Now we're going to focus on the interior of the existing school. Uh, we've Continued demolition, continued tie-ins to the new addition. Those are uh, pretty difficult with the structure of the building. Uh, the admin area, you see the progress. We are framing drywall. We'll be finishing drywall in uh, next week and a half, two weeks, and start then uh, we start painting certain areas and other finishes. Uh, the green wing cord renovations. Uh, we completed demo. Well, we've started the MEP rough end again. That's the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and fire protection rough end. So that's overhead, all the uh, mechanical piping that's above the ceiling you don't see, and all the in wall rough ends. That's all that started. Uh, the gold wing core innovations in a similar, uh, similar situation. It's a little further along. We've started the wall framing and uh, those other MEP rough ends. The fax lab is one of the areas we're turning over again in the summer. Uh, I know it's critical to get that turned over, so we have uh, at least one of the two areas. We have the Culling Arts Lab that is continuing through the uh, in the academic year, not turn over the fall break. Uh, fax lab renovations, we finished the demolition. I completed all the new wall framing. See that MEP rough end, which is substantial in these areas, as you can guess, all those ovens, sinks, dishwashers take a lot of uh, mechanical electrical rough ends. Uh, science classrooms, we've uh, completed those areas primarily as far as the demolition and the drywall and all the finishes. Uh, the bistro kitchenette area. We completed the demolition, started the inner slab, I mean, P inner slab plumbing, and also the overhead MEP rail fence, and uh, started installation of the CMD walls. Once those are complete, a lot of the uh, heavy, heavy construction, heavy mess is going to be out of the building. Uh, guidance renovations, uh, again, turning over with uh, the admin area. Uh, we're pretty much just down to the final thing, but the final touch is on there. Some of the progress we've made in the distant band area. Admin suite, as you can see, we're down the drywall finishing and the paint. Storefronts are in. Uh, the green wing floor renovations, demos complete, continuing with under slab rough ends and overhead rough ends.
same for the, the gold wing core renovations. Uh, progress in the fax lab, all the uh, metal stub walls are framed and we're uh, working to complete the mechanical electrical reference in the walls above the ceiling. construction area, we've uh, completed all the demo, the, the block work is done, we're down to the uh, reframing and back to the right one. Uh, plan work for the next 30 days, we will complete all the site work on the phase one, that's the south side, the south side, new, new addition, uh, paving, it's a big milestone for the exterior work, uh, same for the uh, east side of the building, including the curbs and sidewalks. And paid as well. On the inside of the building, a uh, big milestone we're looking to uh, get the certificate of occupancy from the city of Westfield and then finish our punch list of funding in order for uh, the school to move in and occupy the spaces for this next school year. On the interior side, again, uh, down to punch list and bottom cleaning. On the east side of the building, uh, we did have some existing rooms that were uh, of high importance, so we really stressed those. Uh, those lists were provided from the administration uh, for Westfield of uh, the high school. And so we're listed there, and those are the areas that we really pushed to make sure it was 100% turned over and ready to go as soon as possible. <coughs> Admin and guidance area, uh, down to the finishes. I know it looks pretty rough right now, but once the uh, drywall is finished and the paint and flooring go in, it'll come together really quickly. Those are uh, trays that do go quick. All it takes the longest is always the uh, demo, metal stud, and drywall work, and the mechanical electrical reference. So uh, do bear with us, come together at the last minute usually, and that's again how it's going to work out with the admin guidance area when we're trying to fit quite a bit into the summer months. Uh, next 30 days, still continuing with the green and gold wing renovations. We'll complete all the framing, all the MEP work. Uh, we'll start the ceilings and start the drywall finishes. Uh, same thing for uh, the Shamrock Hall flash renovations and the Colonial Arts Lab, Colonial Arts Area. We'll start the finishes there as well. New cafe and storage. We'll have all the underslab MP work completed. Uh, I mentioned completing the masonry, that's a major highlight for us, as well for the school. Uh, keep a lot of the dirt out of the building and minimize the noise and disturbance to the, to the uh, students. Um, and obviously some of the finishing will continue in those areas. <coughs> An update on our aquatic contingency utilization. Uh, Westfield Indian School finished quite a bit. Uh, with quite a bit of contingency left. Uh, Westfield Middle School, we took the opportunity to use a lot of contingency to address a lot of the uh, existing maintenance items, items that we were not part of the project and that we went ahead and uh, took care of why we were there with the trades that were necessary to do that work, based on the time to scale. And since we had the funds to do so, we, we did that. Uh, Westbrook High School, we're tracking about a little over two thirds. Uh, we have sufficient funds to do the project. And again, that's a uh, similar uh, comment as Westbrook Middle School. There's some unforeseen issues we've addressed that are outside the public scope, and also some value adds that. Uh, we were able to implement and move the project since we did have some contingency at the high school. The Westfield Natatorium. Progress there, about a little over two thirds of the way through the project. Again, that turns over in December. 
of this year. Uh, all the site work is complete. All the site utilities are in. Inside the building, we've completed a lot of the mechanical electrical work. Uh, completely interior CMU walls. Uh, all the structures up. The roof, the roof is currently under construction. And so that will be our next major uh, construction milestone being weather tight. Once the roof's on, we'll be able to protect the building finishes from any sort of water damage and also condition the building so we can continue finishes inside. <coughs> Some photos of the uh, uh, mechanical duct work and the electrical conduit overhead. Uh, interior seeing walls, this looks to be in mechanical spaces. Uh, full concrete, that'll be a, a major a milestone we're going to complete this month. The pool tank itself will be poured. Uh, some aerial photographs we've got here of the progress. Uh, as you see, the building's pretty well taken shape. All the walls are up. The roof is going on now. Uh, that should be complete in the next two weeks or so. The roof, the roof. Next 30 days, uh, we will complete the underground utilities, uh, the storm sewer and the water connections. Uh, the under slab MEP work inside the building itself will be uh, completed. Uh, we'll complete all the curves and walks outside the building, and then we'll start uh, the stone uh, for the asphalt inside the building. Inside the building, the mechanic work overhead will be completed. All the rooftop equipment will be set. All of the uh, roofing will be down to the detail, which means the coping, the, the trim pieces of the roof, and uh, finally starting to paint. So I would say in the next month, uh, month and a half, it will really start looking like an aquatic sign. We'll be bored and just need a little bit of water. Uh, we're proud to say that uh, we've used now the other contingency, so it's utilization. And we'll look to uh, return those funds as, as best we can. That concludes today's update. Thank you. Yes.
uh, the trace back to the panels and the rows so that it wouldn't cause an issue down the road as far as maintenance. I would say those are probably the highlights that we did at the schools. And we'll be happy to have a more complete list, which I believe we've scheduled that out later. So.
So with, um, with any questions this evening, I just ask that you approve personnel as presented. Okay, thank you, Ms. Baldwin. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. All right, second. Any additional discussion? All right, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Mr. Baldwin again. Yes, policies. I bring some policies to you this evening for our first reading. No action this evening. If any of these policies between now and the next board meeting, feel free to reach out with any suggestions or, or, or items you'd like to add or delete from our current policies or any questions you might have. Tonight, we bring some of our both new policies for the district and updated policies based on law after the last uh, legislative session. So working with our uh, CCHA school attorneys, just making sure we're always updated with our policies to match what the law is. So I bring to you tonight for first reading the CDL drug testing policy, standard of care and supervision of students, eligible students, legal settlement, student attendance, communicable diseases, administration of medication, homeless children, uh, test security for statewide assessments, and program for students with disabilities. So again, first reading, no action. Feel free to reach out in the next, uh, in the next few weeks before our next board meeting with any, any information you'd like to share. Thanks so much. All right. Um, Dr. Monolo, ratifying the Shamrock Pond easement agreement. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, we uh, sold the land out by Shamrock Springs uh, years ago, and uh, we had a contract, and we needed to uh, addend that contract in regards to now having more specific language on what the responsibilities would be of uh, the owner of uh, the project and uh, what their obligation was and is uh, going forward. There will be a uh, spectacular outdoor science lab uh, that Mr. Hedges, uh, the principal at Shamrock Springs, is incredibly proud of. Uh, he and his staff and uh, community folks from the Shamrock area have been working on this project uh, along with the developers and, uh, and architects and, and local folks. Uh, to make this dream come true. Uh, they are digging dirt as we speak uh, and building the pond. Uh, and so uh, we believe that we have uh, all of the language exactly where it needs to be in the obligations met that uh, Mr. Hedges and myself talked to you about in an executive session about a month ago. And uh, our representatives have taken care of all the uh, all of the specifics and so we just request from an administration standpoint uh, that the board uh, approve and ratify uh, the easement at Shamrock Springs Elementary. Thank you. All right, I'd like to entertain a motion to ratify the uh, Shamrock Pond easement agreement. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All right, thank you. Any additional discussion? Thanks to Joe for getting together with the comments we have in the Right, thank you so much. Alrighty, um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. All right, um, Brooke Watkins. Good evening, um, I have two grants to bring to you this evening. The first one is the Project Lead the Way Training Grant. And uh, for all of our courses that uh, we offer through Project Lead the Way, they do require teacher training. And every year we can be, we are eligible for one grant per training area. So this year we had a need in engineering and biomedical sciences due to some resignation in staff, as well as growth in our biomedical sciences programs. We had a need for four people to be trained and Project Lead the Way graciously agreed to uh, all four grants instead of just two this year. So we are requesting that the board approves the Project Lead the Way grant of four grants and $2,500 each for a total of $10,000. Okay, thank you. All right, I will entertain a motion. And do we have a second? All right, thank you. All right, any additional discussion? All right, we always appreciate getting more money. Thank you, Brooke. All right, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 
Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. All right. Brooke again. Yep, and the second grant I have tonight is our formative assessment grant, which is an Indiana Department of Education grant that's provided to um, schools across the state. Um, so this funds our NWEA testing for students in all students K through 8, and then some students in 9 and 10. It also funds our iReady Math Diagnostic uh, for students in grades K through 6. So Lynn Schemmel, our district test coordinator, manages this grant. We really appreciate the work that she does on this grant. She also serves on the uh, Department of Education formative assessment grant committee to ensure certain programs, uh, the programs that they approve, which includes both iReady and NWEA, are aligned to our Indiana ed academic standards. So this year, um, our grant amount is $86,376, and um, we just recommend that the board also approves this for the 2021 school year. Great, thank you so much. All right, I'll entertain motion. I'll move to approve the formative assessment grant as presented. Thank you. Second? Second. All righty. Any additional discussion or questions? All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right. Motion carries. All right. Carrie all day. There she is. <laughs> Hello. We have some more grants. Um, tonight we have the Title IV Innovation Grant. This, like a lot of the grants, sometimes we just get an allocation. This grant was a competitive grant. So um, school districts from across the state applied, and we were awarded this grant. Um, the intent of this grant is to directly increase students' social and emotional wellness through innovative programming, emphasizing on well-rounded educational opportunities. We have several goals of this grant, and one is to provide some professional development resources for seventh and eighth grade wellness teachers which then they will implement the learning to breathe curriculum to increase students' ability to identify and regulate emotions. And this will happen for all seventh and eighth graders through their wellness class. In addition, we will provide resources to build peer-to-peer -peer relationships for elementary students in a pilot program that will occur right here at Washington Woods. And then finally, to provide resources for targeted professional development for building, uh, for building level SEL, MTSS, and equity teams. This grant, issues um, was for forty thousand uh, dollars and we do want to thank Kyle Miller um, for really taking the lead on this grant the second um, competitive grant was a 2020 project aware grant you might have seen that DOE just did a, a, a release of information to share at the schools that received this grant and we were one of them um, this grant is uh, will enhance the social emotional and mental health awareness and supports for all stu for students um, through this grant, we will focus on professional development opportunities for district leadership and district staff in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we will also focus on building emotional identification and regulation skills in our middle school students. And we want to initiate a pilot mental health service scholarship program for uninsured, underinsured, or economically disadvantaged students. This grant was for um, 58000 and again, this was also a competitive grant. So tonight, we are asking um, the Board of Education to approve the 2020 Title IV um, Innovation Grant and the 2020 Project Aware Grant, as presented. Thank you so much. I'll entertain the motion. I'll move to approve the 2020 Title IV Innovation Grant and Project Aware Grants. Thank you, Dwayne. Do I have a second? All right. Any additional discussion or questions? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. And one more grant. <laughs> yes. So we have the 2020 um, CARES Act, and this is the Corona Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. And um, this was an allocation that was provided to Westfield Washington Schools, and it was based on our the Title I formula. Um, and so, and even though it's based on the Title I formula, it's a little different. It can be utilized by all, it can benefit all of our schools, not just our Title I schools. And so, with this grant, it's really um, supposed to help with needs that were due to um, COVID. 
And so we have three broad areas that we'll be, we will be focusing on, or I should say we have focused on. Um, one was technology preparedness, and this we use funds to help provide um, 150 hotspots that we provided to families and to staff members that were in need either do not to not have a broadband or living in a rural area that didn't get broadband. And we also had six months of internet access for those hotspots. Um, another piece was the additional feeding that we did. Um, as we all know, due to COVID-19, we adjusted some feeding opportunities for students. Um, and through this, some of it was reimbursable, but some of it because of where we're at and it was free and reduced, not all of it was reimbursable. So as of June 25th, we served 27,882 meals, which um, equated to around, no, I'm sorry, I apologize for that. As of June 25th, we served 82,680 meals, but we're getting reimbursed for around about 28,000, which equates so right around um, $44,000. So we're using some of that money to help the, the ones that were not reimbursable. Um, a third area of this grant is for some summer learning. Each year, um, the high school works with the Indiana Online Academy to write summer school. Um, that some of it is reimbursable by the state, but not all of it is. Due to COVID, the numbers were higher. Each year, the state has a pot of money that is for reimbursable and it's split up depending on the schools that participate. This year, many more schools are participating due to COVID, and so our expenses are higher, so we're using some of this funds also for that. Um, in addition, this is, there is an equitable share portion for our non-public schools, and St. Maria Brady decided to opt into that opportunity, and they're buying um, a couple laptops um, for the fair fund. So our total funding was $164,922.12. And um, of that, $1,336.18 went to St. Maria Freddy. So we are asking the board um, to approve the 2020 Peers Grant as presented. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I will entertain a motion. Thank you. How about a second? Sorry. All right. Thank you. Any additional discussion? That was a lot of meals, 82,000 meals, twice a week. Yeah, it's very good. And we really appreciate all the work of all of our food, um, food service. And also, we had a lot of WWS staff that always volunteered to either help bag or help pass out meals. So, I mean, it was a big endeavor. Yes, absolutely. All right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. All right, motion carries. All right, Dr. Gray. Okay, so we have some guests with us this evening, Evan Hawk and Carol Sergi, and they are here with TMAP this evening, and I can give you a chance to maybe share a little bit about what your endeavor is all about. But you are an Indiana-based startup company using technology and uh, targeted marketing, really, to identify, engage, and recruit talent for companies and communities across Indiana. And so they've spent the last two years assembling a database of the addressable talent pool for the state of Indiana. And so their role in their initiative is to help the community identify the best recruits, run engagement campaigns to attract recruits um, from, or to the state, and then match them to a marketplace of companies in the region. And so what I'm bringing to the board tonight for a recommendation is to enter into a memorandum of understanding with TMAP and that would be to provide them with um, information that is allowable for our students' database to be able to recruit talent and bring them back to Indiana. Would you like to share anything? Thank you for having us. We're, uh, so this is Carol Sergi from uh, Invest Hamilton uh, County. Um, as uh, Dr. Great said, my name is Evan Hawk. I'm from TMAP. Um, uh, we are a local uh, technology firm, uh, and our mission is to recruit talented individuals that have moved out of the state back to the state. And so how do we do that? We partner with local communities to identify those recruits and uh, market to them. And then our role is to actually find them jobs, help them uh, get introduced to companies and uh, uh, with any support in moving. So we're partnering with all the school systems uh, throughout Hamilton County. We have Hamilton Southeast and Hamilton Heights have signed up already. 
Uh, and so this memorandum of understanding is essentially outlining our uh, relationship with, uh, with Westfield. Um, uh, basically, our database holds the entire addressable talent pool for, um, throughout the country. Uh, uh, by providing some of the um, uh, publicly available information on alumni from, uh, from the schools, we're able to identify who in our database are uh, alums and, um, and who we should go target to uh, move back to Hamilton County. So, happy to answer any questions. Appreciate the time. Thank you, Evan. And so with that, I would like to recommend that the Board of School Trustees approve the MOU with TMAP. Okay, with that, we'll entertain a motion. So moved. All righty. Uh, do I have a second? I will second that. Any additional questions or comments? I'm with Hamilton County Economic Development. We contracted with TMAP because we created the 21st Century Talent Region for Hamilton County. My job is to attract and retain talent for the county um, so that we have the right talent. Prior to COVID, of course, we were trying to, um, we had such a low unemployment rate that we were trying to bring people here to live and work and bring back people who are from Hamilton County to come back here. Um, now we're just um, really working on trying to retain people who are leaving here. Um, we have a lot of people who graduate from uh, schools in Indiana and don't come back, and we're trying to work on ways with the help of TMAP to identify people who have graduated from Hamilton County Schools, moved to other places in the country, and then we want to bring them back and help them find jobs here in the county. Okay, thanks for asking, Bill. All righty, um, do I have a motion? Sorry about that. All right, uh, that was the discussion and questions. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Sorry, motion carries. All right, Mr. Tom Michael. First up tonight is a request to authorize weekly check runs for the district. Um, normally we only pay utilities or certain bills that have a due date on a weekly basis. During COVID, due to everybody working remotely, just less hours in the building, we have been working more on a weekly check run basis. Um, what we found during that is it really eliminates that bulge coming through um, once a month and kind of backlogging the entire system as we work and it kind of made it more smooth workflow for the entire finance department. Um, kept everybody more on the track, better pace, um, everything just ran a little smoother. So we are asking if we can continue that process for the remainder of the year. Um, we made it a kind of a yearly um, authorization that we can come back every year for any reason, any time you want us to stop, we have a clean stop point at that time as well. Um, and then um, I did put in there just a reminder that anything over 50,000 would still require special board approval. So normally those are gonna be contracts that are gonna come to the board prior for authorization anyways. So those documents will not be carried through on a normal weekly truck run unless they had already been pre-approved at a ask that you approve weekly checkers. Okay. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to authorize weekly checkers. Okay, I'll second that. Any additional questions? All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. And opposed same sign. Motion carries. Mr. Tom Michael again. So the next item is sale of two old vehicles, two old trucks that we have over at the um, mechanics barn at the transportation department. Um, one truck is a 2003 Ford F-250, one is a 2001 GMC Sierra. 
uh, both vehicles are to the point of disrepair that we could not even get the odometer to turn on to get a mileage for you. So they are pretty bad. Um, I will say our maintenance, our mechanics do a fantastic job of keeping something running to the last day. Um, so the fact that you know, we're basically in a 19 and 17 year old truck is impressive for how many miles we usually put on the vehicle. So we were able to get um, two quotes to sell. So it's not a lot, but we would ask permission to move forward with selling both of those vehicles. Okay, sounds like a good idea. I'll entertain a motion. Thank you, Bill. I will second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. And one more item, donations and grants, Mr. Tom Michael. So we have one donation for board policy. The donation of about $5,000 has to be for the board for official approval. Um, we have a $10,000 donation from Genesis Church. Um, all credit to this one goes to Kyle Miller. He's been the one working with them to um, kind of carry on this conversation, I believe, for a couple months now. And then they finally reached out and said, how could we utilize some dollars if we could give them? So um, that line is in your board report of where Kyle wanted to utilize those funds. I know he's very excited to have the dollars utilized as well, and we're always grateful for a $10,000 donation. Absolutely. I'll entertain a motion. All right, I'll second that. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. And thank you very much to Genesis Church. All right. Mr. Tom Michael, you're up again. So if it's okay with the board, I will go through all these at one time like we normally do. Is that sure. fine? Okay. Um, and then I just wanted to clarify one thing. It's not in any of these resolutions, but just a comment that was made earlier of the $66 million. So when we do these projects, we have to list a max term, a max uh, annual debt payment, and then a max rate. Um, all those categories cannot be gone over. What you will often see is because of when the project's taking place and timelines are first year or two, the payments can be higher than our total payments because of capitalized interest. Um, so oftentimes we list that max rate just because we can't go over that initial threshold. Um, if you look at the actual payback of this, we, we cannot exceed the 5%, which was in the resolution, I believe, two months ago, or back in February. Um, if, you know, so actually texting Matt real quick during the meeting, uh, if we sold these today, we expect to be closer to 3% interest rate. Um, and our current projections that we're utilizing in our tax rate projections is $12 million in interest, which is based on the 5% um, rate that was approved. So um, I understand if you look at them, sometimes you just want to calculate all the numbers out, and that's why you can get a bigger number, but um, we have to set max on each line, which can give that um, appearance, but that's not the legality case line. So, um, I will read each resolution. Um, sorry for the long-windedness on these, and then if you have any questions, let me know. So the first resolution um, authorizing the execution of lease agreement as required by school leasing statute IC 2047-3, after a hearing, the school board must approve the lease and authorize the officers to execute such agreement. This lease is the agreement by whereby the school corporation will levy the required property tax to pay the lease payments. The lease payments will be paid by the building corporation and used to pay the bondholders. Without the lease, bondholders will have no assurance that the building corporation will repay the bonds. The lease is a mechanism by which the property tax collections can get to the bondholders. The additional appropriation resolution, resolution 2020-19. After the additional appropriation hearing, the school board will adopt the resolutions which outlines the appropriation of funds received for the um, sale of real estate, which in this case is to pay off the debt and to build the structure. Um, the resolution also though specifies that the funds will be placed in the school corporation construction account, which we continue to use Bank of New York Mellon, um, separate from all other school corporation funds until the project is completed. As required by the school leasing statute IC 2047-3, the board must determine the, the sorry, resolution determining the need for the project, um, which is kind of where Dr. Gray explained the need. Um, as required by the school leasing statute 2047-3, the board must determine that there is a need for the project. Um, resolution assigning construction bids and contractors for building corporation. The building corporation will own the real estate upon which the new early learning central office will be constructed, building building to be constructed. The building corporation will also be the issuer of the bonds. The bond proceeds will be held by the trustee bank, which again is Bank New York Mellon, and will be used to pay the, the contractors for the work done on the building. 
As a result, the construction bids and the contracts will need to be in the building corporation, will need to be with the building corporation because the building corporation will hold the money and pay the contract. In other words, the school corporation receives the bids and the contracts awarded, the bids and the contract under state law, and assign those um, to the contracts to the building corporation. Um, as Rebecca and I were talking real quick, just kind of a reminder for the board, the bids will come in at a later time. The board still has to approve the bids and we will not issue these bonds until the bridge bids have been approved so we can ensure that the project's gonna come in under what we're gonna issue. It would not make any sense to issue debt and then hope the bids come in. So that's the word of that vote. Um, the next resolution approving the sixth supplement to the master continuing disclosure undertaking and issuing bonds. Um, the SEC requires that school corporations enter into a sixth supplemental master continuing disclosure undertaking before it issues bonds. The uh, school corporation has previously entered into this type of agreement. Um, where we have to make sure items are posted to Emma on a um, timely basis. Um, as we kind of discussed with past issues, we utilize Ice Miller for this. Um, they do a really good job. We have to file a quarterly report with them to make sure we're compliant on items. And then also they help us ensure that Emma is up to date. Um, it's not an area where you want to make the SEC map. So you make sure all those are compliant up to date and we're able to utilize Ice Miller for that. And then the final resolution is approving issuance of bond anticipation notes. Um, the board will approve the issuance of bond anticipation notes for one or more series to permit the payment of preliminary costs related to the project. The bond anticipation notes would be repaid by the issuance of the bonds. Um, while this is in here, I can tell you my preference is long term that we avoid doing this. Um, it does give us that ability. Um, we had the first actually Crite bill come in today because we're working on the land and finishing up you know, the site work of where's everything going to go, what's it going to look like, and where's everything located at and we will do our best to make sure we pay all those with cash on hand because that is in the long run the cheapest way to do it. However, if this project gets pushed farther down the road and we have more architect fees coming in as the design's happening, um, we do have the ability to issue a band at that time, which is a lot of anticipation that will give us the money to help pay those expenses as they occur. So it gives us the ability, does not mean we have to, but it is there and we clearly have conversations before when that time comes if it can. So if there's any questions, please let me know. Okay, thank you. I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve resolutions 2020-18 through 20, yeah, through 2020-23 as they relate to the Early Learning Center Central Office Lease at All right, do we have a second? All right, thank you. Any additional questions or discussion? for discussion uh, some of the things that weighed into my thought process uh, knowing this was on the agenda and the time that we are you know what is amidst us right um, there's a lot of unknowns but as you can tell our business corporation as a school and most of your companies are moving forward as a going concern we cannot predict what will happen but we certainly can't stop planning for things that will happen when our life can resume, when a vaccine comes in, herd immunity, whatever, you, whatever your stance is on COVID, we, we will be again. So knowing that there were a lot of time and effort gone into this process, a lot of expenses, this is not a cheap process to get to this point not wanting to lose those dollars and that energy, and also knowing that if, if we are under another lockdown, if the economy were to um, backslide and we are not able to continue expanding um, our teaching staff, which primarily is utilized by the Early Learning Center at this time, um, we can stop at the point of issuing the construction bids. So there, there is still a time in my mind that I can in good faith move forward with this and know that before it becomes an irresponsible spin uh, and a burden on our community, we could address it and um, take a different path. Thank you, Rebecca. All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed same sign. 
All right, motion carries. Okay, believe it or not, we have come to the public comment section. Just a few quick reminders. Oh, okay. All right, as a few quick reminders to the com public comments, the purpose of the comment period is to allow the public to give the board feedback or comment, but the board is in a listening mode and we um, do not engage in conversation or debate. The comment cards have been, um, are required and I do have those. And speaking is limited to three minutes per person. And as I said earlier, the board will stay until everybody that wants to speak is provided an opportunity to do so. And as always, um, please be respectful with your comments. So we will begin. Okay, Ronnie Sanders. Good evening, uh, Ronnie Saunders, uh, 4541 Lloyd Place in Westfield. Uh, I'm actually um, a parent of a well, potentially student of this elementary school, uh, hopefully kindergarten coming up this year. And uh, I guess just my uh, uh, concern, uh, not only as a parent, but as somebody who lives here in Westfield, that says, uh, with the upcoming school year, again, there'll be questions of how, how things are gonna go. We've, we've heard of and seen uh, the reopening, uh, I guess the reopening process uh, that's going to be taking place here in Westville Schools. And, uh, my, uh, I guess my concern is, are there gonna be any kind of contingency plans or are there any contingency plans in place? Uh, at my, I guess, uh, looking forward, I, I noticed how things happened in Marion County uh, when the pandemic was first uh, first broke out and how uh, the schools in Hamlin County eventually followed suit uh, and I guess just wondering how that's going to look, how that's going to take place uh, with our, our children, especially our, our early starters. Like I said, I'm a father of a soon-to-be kindergartner who enjoyed her preschool year, uh, is uh, loving learning, and is very interested in continuing on. She has seen this building. Um, she is excited about kindergarten, but I don't want uh, to stifle that, that love and desire for school, especially at such an early age. Um, I guess, uh, really, I'm just looking for some kind of, uh, I guess, uh, contingency or backup plan um, and if there's if that's possible, you know, if, if I could find that either on the website or maybe talk to somebody after the fact, um, really kind of curious and probably like a lot of parents, really trying to weigh our options right now because she's 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 a smart girl. We talk to her about what's going on in the world. She's not excited about wearing masks. She's not excited about you know social distancing and um, you know it's I, I know that. These are kind of hindrances that, that uh, could be an issue for somebody's learning. And um, not for only my child, but for all the children and the families that are making these decisions. I'm just uh, hoping that there's some kind of contingency plan um, that, that we can hopefully look forward to. Uh, I know a lot of folks are for distance learning. Some are uh, against it. Uh, I have my own personal views on it, but just looking really just for some, for some insight and some guidance and hopefully uh, that's something that all parents are dealing with that here in this district to find. Thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. That's a moment. Hi, my name is Josh Walker. I'm a senior at Westwood High School. 
Um, the past three years at WHS have gone by in the blink of an eye, and I would not change it for the world, especially because of the amazing staff that we have at WHS. We are blessed with some of the best staff members who really do care about our students, from Dr. McGuire, counselors, teachers, and even our awesome lunch ladies. Dr. McGuire truly is a blessing to our community and to Westwood High School. Speaking from personal experience, my neighbor Jacob passed away sophomore year when I was a freshman. Dr. McGuire came on the PA system to let us know what had happened. It was a devastating loss for our community and our school system, but thanks to Dr. McGuire, the grieving process was a lot easier. Not easy, but easier. Dr. McGuire opened up our learning center and allowed students to go down at any time, even during class, and grieve and process the terrible information we had received that day. This is just one of many times she has put her students first. I moved to Westfield in sixth grade, so I didn't really experience what it was like to grow up here. But I do know that at WHS, we were taught about the Westfield way. Dr. McGuire did a great job at teaching us all, all her students, or her kids as she calls us, how to demonstrate the Westfield way and what it really does mean to be a shamrock. If you aren't familiar with this, the Westwood Way is, is a pledge every day to be 10% kinder, 10% more present, 10% more positive, and to be 10% more grateful. How does what is happening right now demonstrate the Westfield Way? I believe we should practice what we preach. So, is moving Dr. McGuire to a position that she doesn't want being more kind and more positive? Going into my senior year, I should not be afraid to walk the halls of WHS without my amazing principal by my side. Speaking for the student body and for all of my senior class, we need Dr. McGuire. With all the chaos going on right now, we really cannot do this next school year without her. Finally, I have a question for you all that I would like to let sit with you. Have any of your children ever struggled with mental health and you got angry when someone made things worse for them? That's what our parents are feeling. Angry that we do not have answers and that this decision is making their children struggle. Thank you.
if it were true. I run to these sons of God. They want Stacy back. And if that won't happen, then they're asking to please leave the elevation in place as interim principals so they have one less thing to worry about. The school board used to have a good pulse on the culture of the schools, but that's changed in the past few years, and that needs to change back. Some of you were specifically told last year by high school staff that we didn't want the school day time change. And I remember you saying that you were surprised because Dr. Green had told you that we're all that we were all for it. So who do you think was telling the truth in that case? We certainly had no reason to lie. So I say again, it's time for the school board to reassure teachers that their value is professionals and that they won't be punished for speaking their minds. It's time for the board to get out and talk to teachers to find out what they need and what their students really need. And it's time to stop blindly trusting that you're being told the entire truth. Thank you.
The message sounds good, but it never acknowledges the continuous failures of our school systems to the minority community. I'm also a 2011 graduate from this school system. Sorry, Mom. Uh, perhaps most importantly, there is no apology. As far as I know, I already said this part, but as far as I know, at no point has the district offered an apology to the recent victims of racial bigotry and hate. There are plenty of opportunities for offer an apology. During the best time, the principal of the middle school tried to save face and insinuate that the victimized students' parents were somewhat lying about the reported incidents when he made a largely true comment. After that statement was made, we were told that the principal, I was, not we, I'm not going to put any of us on there, from my aspect, he's not an ally. We removed an ally from the high school. Mr. Well, I'll skip it to the end. You say you hear us, but do you really? Are you really listening to the minorities within our district? We are highly concerned by what appears to be a hapless leader 
We are concerned that the sheep are being led to slaughter by a wolf in sheep's clothing. Superintendent Ray.
What are the known costs, such as salary and benefits, and, and the startup costs of the program? What are the goals of the program, and how are we defining success? If it is successful and kids move away from traditional learning, how much less will we be given for each alternative student from the state? If the alternative learning program does not end up being a viable solution with the current budget, what will become of Dr. McGuire's position? We want to ensure that alternative learning is a necessary step for our community and that we have validated that it is worth the cost. How can we afford this now with increased budgetary needs due to COVID safety implementation? Thank you. Thank you. Ann Wolf. Uh, good evening. I have three easy questions for the board and for Dr. Gray. Um, one might actually call them softball questions. And I sincerely implore the board and Dr. Gray to respond in communication to the WWS community as soon as possible. Could you please explain why it's in the best interest of the students to begin the creation of an alternative learning program for WWS right now, at this time, the start of the 2021 school year? Number two, could you please explain why is it why it is in the best interest of the high school students to have their principal removed and appointed as the administrator of an alternative learning program right now at the start of the 2021 school year. And lastly, could you please explain why is it in the best interest of our high school students to introduce a new leader in the midst of unprecedented Of this type of program? 
What if the program is not viable or fiscally achievable? What becomes of Dr. McGuire? Were all these factors weighed and discussed amongst the board? Do you feel the decision to devote Dr. McGuire, made by three board members and Dr. Bray, reflects the will of the community that you are, to re you are representing as a petition to bring back Dr. McGuire and nearly 5,000 signatures? In a 2016 current in Westfield interview with Dr. Bray when she came on board, she noted it was important to educate the community on how our schools are funded. I also believe that it's important for the community to know how the funds are being utilized. <coughs> While I care about Dr. McGuire as a person, I believe it's her assets that WHS truly need and are we putting her skills to the best use. As members of the school board and superintendent, I'm assuming your roles are to better the system for the children. And if you're truly interested in doing the best thing for the kids, why would you abandon all of our kids by removing one of the best high school principals of the state? This is not divisive action. This is dissent with the actions of certain school board members and the superintendent. Dr. Gray, you asked for input when you announced this exciting news from diverse constant, uh, constituent groups, including students, staff, and community members. Here it is. We remember in November. Don't we give both sides of stories and not just punish one side or the other? 
I know Dr. Drake shared her side of the story with you, but did you get or reach out to Dr. McGuire to get her side of the story? If your son would have been disciplined by a teacher or a coach without hearing his side of the story, would you be okay with that? I know Bill would have called me right away. <laughs> um, we expect our administrators, coaches, teachers to treat our children a certain way. Shouldn't we be that example on how to treat people? Shouldn't we treat others like the way we would want to be treated? And go off the long young lady that was just up there, as my dad said, it's only a mistake if you can't fix it. Thank goodness for the spell check when it comes to writing emails and everything else. Thank you. And the 
his community in a climate of uncertainties? Where was the compassion in this decision? The human quality of understanding the suffering of others and wanting to do something about it. This was a quality that Dr. McGuire had for her staff, teachers, and especially her students. She had deep awareness of empathy for another suffering. We as a community have a chance to go back and make this right if she's not brought back as principal of Westfield High School. If you can wrap up, I will. I have food for thought for each one of you. If you're thinking about another referendum, a referendum, you better think again. Thank you for giving me the time to speak. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you tonight. It seems to me that we've come to an impasse here. It's hurt the community. It's hurt a lot of our members. I don't have children in the schools. I volunteered. I've raised money for the schools in various capacities. I helped get the new stadium built. And I'm very proud of our efforts working together as an entire community. My, many things have been said that I was thinking about saying. So I'll make this short. I think the conundrum we find ourselves in is that it wasn't a clear-cut decision. The vote on the school board was three to two. There are some reasons why two of you voted to not suspend or, or transfer Stacy McGuire from the high school. Three of you decided that it was something that needed to happen. This is not very clear for us. So I think a lot of us here in this building are very confused after all that Stacy put into her position and the love of our community and the way she served the students, our, our cherished children in this community. So I'm a little bit disappointed, I'm very confused, and I don't uh, quite understand, but we're not to the road of no return at this point. There may be something that can be done not only affects the schools, it affects the city and its operations and the future of our community in, in terms of development and outcome. And money isn't the thing here, it's doing the right thing here. Thank you. Good things about her. 
I am disappointed, actually, that in that meeting that night, it was asked the question of, is this a personal problem that you have with Dr. McGuire? The question was asked multiple times, and the answer was no, but yet no reason was given as to why she would need a new position. Did she want this? And if she did, why isn't she here tonight telling us that this was her decision? Yeah. I would like to know what the budget is for the Alternative Learning Center. 
Where are the funds for that department coming from? And are we certain that the funds will be available for this initiative for the coming year and the next several years after that? The issues surrounding COVID-19 may affect funding for this coming school year. So is this the right time to be funding, I'm sorry, be funding a new initiative? And could um, this question be addressed publicly? Could there be some input? Second, um, this is a general question. It's not associated with any specific employee. What is the process when an employee, whether under contract or salary, is quote unquote reassigned to a different position? Are there written procedures for this type of transfer? <laughs> I'm cold, I'm shaking, I'm cold. When an employee is informed that they are being reassigned, what are the options available to that employee? What factors does the school board consider when approving a reassignment such as this? I believe this is also an issue that the general public would like clarified. And the third thing is, has the position of principal of the Westville High School been posted yet? And how widely has this position been advertised? Since we currently have two qualified people acting in this position, there needn't be a rush to hire someone right away. Will the names of the finalists be made public? And will the community input be encouraged and will it be accepted in regarding this really important position? And I'd like to remind the board, they were voted onto this board to represent the interests of the students, the parents, and the taxpaying members of this community. Obviously, I'm too old to have a kid in school, but I had one go through school. I'm a taxpayer, and so I have, still have an interest in what goes on in this school. And I guess I can echo everybody else's opinion. We will remember in November. Gina Shafee. Immediately after the people protest on June 16, Sherry Gray issued this statement. We understand the passionate support for Dr. McGuire. Watching and reading what has transpired over the past several days is disheartening. Disagreeing with decisions made by the superintendent and the school board is understandable and expected. However, the personal attacks and hatefulness toward the school board members, WWS administration, and the superintendent only serves to further divide us. <laughs> this statement was published by local media, in print, and on television. In effect, the superintendent patronizingly admonished the entire community the taxpayers, her boss, the people who fund her paycheck. She also implies that the community does not have a right to peaceful protest. I'm embarrassed by her lack of professionalism and concerned that prospective home buyers with children will see this statement or refrain from coming to our community. It's embarrassing. I have several questions regarding the superintendent's performance and evaluation. One, is there a protection of reputation clause in the current superintendent contract? By that I mean, if the superintendent harms, disparages, or demeans the school or its employees, are there consequences? If not, why not? If so, does she get a written warning? Will it go into her personnel file? Can she be terminated? I know that the superintendent has written up other employees for this exact same thing. Shouldn't she be treated the same? with the superintendent. So it leads us to wonder how she was hired. 
Can you tell me who was involved in hiring her? Was it only the school board or were principals, teachers, and parents involved? This is an important decision. It would seem like it would be hard for just one group to make that decision. Finally, it's not sensible to believe anything other than Dr. McGuire's reassignment was because Sherry Gray could not get along with Stacy. Since such a large part of the community has worked with Dr. McGuire, we know that the problem does not lie with her. It seems the superintendent couldn't motivate or lead, so she pettily risked the education of the community's children to ingratiate herself. The community is frightened that our highest ranking school official does not have the children's welfare fair as her top priority. We are frightened that she can threaten her employees and create a culture of fear where her children go to school. I ask the school board, please consider this public outcry. I wanted to switch gears a little bit 
and uh, talk about executive sessions. Um, I've been a member of the Washington Township Board now for 19 months, which is the same amount of time that Bill and Rebecca have been on this school board. Um, in the 19 months that I've been on the West Coast Washington Board, we've had one executive session, and that was due to pending litigation. Since January 2020, since I can't go back any farther on the website, the school board has had approximately 10 executive sessions. In an article from the American Association of School Administrators, which I'll forward to all board members, the author warns that getting into the habit of scheduling an executive session before each school board meeting that was supposed to be one tonight, thankfully it was canceled, is a red flag. And executive sessions are often incorrectly used to decide what's going to be said in a meeting, who's going to say it, um, possibly even talk about votes, or to discuss an agenda that could be threatened, or an agenda item that could be threatened. Yesterday, I spoke to Indiana Public Access Counselor Luke Britt, and he confirmed that the need for executive sessions should be exercised judiciously and infrequently. He also told me a story about for, the Fort Wayne City Council. Bill, you're from Fort Wayne, right? Yep. All right, Fort Wayne City Council. This is the second largest municipality in our state. So earlier this spring, the Fort Wayne City Council reached out to Luke Britt, the public access counselor, and said, we need your help. We need to have an executive session executive session, and it's been 25 years, or possibly longer, since we've had an executive session. Um, they couldn't remember any farther back, because that's as long as their attorney had been there. Um, maybe more than 25 years, like I said, their attorney didn't know. If the second largest municipality in our state can go that long without holding an executive session, surely our school, school board can start doing more business in the public. Mm -hmm. And Rebecca, thank you for making some comments. If you guys don't know, executive sessions are closed meetings, um, and you never get to find out what happens in, in them. I have no problem with that, but it seems like we're doing them quite often with the school board. And so my request is start having conversation in public not behind closed doors, even talking to each other on the phone, bring it to the meetings and tell us what's going on. Um, again, Rebecca, I appreciate you speaking up tonight, and I would just request that you start doing more business in public and less executive sessions. Thank you. for asking questions and accountability. I will do so tonight. Yes, I would like to ask one-on-one -on -one all five members of the school board, Dr. Gray and Dr. McGuire, to get that whole perspective Unfortunately, I know I can't do that because there are constraints, and I respect those constraints, having served on the Board of Zoning Appeals that has some similar constraints about talking with the public. My concern is, and I understand the passion that is going around the community, my concern is, is there going to be a polarization of both the community and the school system, rightfully or wrongfully done. I'm hearing about remember in November. I'm hearing some alluding that there's basically a 3-2 rubber stamp mm -hmm. favoring what Dr. Great offers. Remember in November, that concerns me. 
Will there be a 3-2 or 4-1 or 5-0 rubber stamp that disagrees with Dr. Gray? Mm -hmm. I would ask you, a rubber stamp has no purpose on a board, school board or otherwise. Does it make any difference if it's pro or con? The, the board is charged to be objective and unbiased. Is that going to happen in November, November? I'm asking. I don't have that answer yet. I had a gut feeling from the previous election that that's another story. But I'm asking, is that going to be what's going to happen? I've heard of pretty much a vilification of Superintendent Dr. Gray. I'm a little surprised I haven't seen the burning and burning of effigy yet. But I can see it happening. I would ask this of the public. How many of you could manage a multi-million dollar budget, deal with an expanding student population, plan the uh, campus and buildings that will take care of that exploding population and throw in a global pandemic on top of it. How many of you would change and take her job, walk in her shoes, sit in her desk for a month? I know I don't have those skill sets. I wouldn't even begin to try. Would you? She's not perfect, I understand that, none of us are. She's probably made some mistakes along the way. Most of us have made mistakes in our lifetime. But there's an accountability. And that accountability is a two-way street. From them and us. I think we can do better. Both ways. Thank you. Natalie Henry. I'm oh, sorry, what?
John Miller. We recently moved here a little over a year and a half ago, and my subject is not about uh, what is going on, um, but it's Stacey Moore. Um, although I do feel the same as all of you. Um, I just had a high schooler that uh, graduated and loved her. My subject is about what we're going to do moving into the school year. Um, I'm going to preface by saying I'm a medical laboratory scientist. Okay? So I test COVID for all of our community. So with that, I do a lot of research and I deal with facts and data. When I deal with facts and data, I wonder why we want to put our kids in a face mask. CDC put out their study on May 5th, 2020, that stated that a 72 year study to fight pandemics, viral pandemics, non pharmaceutical ways to do it, 72 years from 1946 to 2018. There's four different ways to fight pandemics that they talked about and did studies on for these 72 years. Face masks was one of the things they did studies on. And that study shows that it is zero, zero in helping stop the spread. And you guys all want to know why? That's because a virus is too small to be stopped by a mask. It is only five times larger than O2. So we're going to put kids in masks that will not wear them, that will get punished in school for not wearing them. They will constantly fidget and touch their face and touch their face. They will build up bacteria within their mask because bacteria is over a hundred times larger than the virus and will be stopped by the mask. Because they'll be wearing it for over six hours in a day. On top of that, they may end up with hypercapnia. They may get some CO2 toxicity. What that will do to them is make them lose concentration. That can give them headaches. There are already individuals throughout this nation that are having health issues from wearing masks too long. There are facts, there are studies. I encourage all of you to please look at this. It is all over. Do not listen to the news. Look at the facts. Look at the data. It will tell you what can harm your child. This will not harm your child by not, by, by not wearing a mask. Wearing a mask will harm your child. Thank you. Maybe she left. Rebecca Banter. Thank you all. Thank you all for your time. Um, I'm here to address some points about the search for our new high school principal. I wonder how we can possibly get a qualified high school principal this close to the start of the school year. Are we really going to find the best leader for our award-winning high school in a month? 
This decision of selecting a new high school principal will affect our children for years to come, and they deserve the best candidate we can find, not the best candidate we can get in a month before school starts. Many schools start before ours. Has consideration been given to what kind of principal would walk out on their school after school has started? Or someone who would resign right before it starts? Why would we want someone who is willing to do that? If we get someone from our own district, then we're further disrupting our own students during an already chaotic time. I echo a sentiment that's been shared her here earlier when I say I teach my children that it is okay to admit when you have made a mistake. Can you admit that you made a mistake that when you decided it was a good idea to reassign Dr. Stacy McGuire? You all have the power to change that decision and completely focus on safely starting school again in a month. If you are unwilling to do that, we ask that you please maintain the current interim principals at Westfield High School and take the necessary time to conduct a legitimate search for a new principal. Please do this as it is in the best interest of our children. Thank you.
Good evening, and I apologize for the crowd, but I'm not here to talk about the principal, although there could have been a lot of discussion about that. But I want to focus instead on essentially my kids. Uh, see, I'm the father of a fifth Speak grader. Speak into the mic, please. I'm, I'm the father of a fifth grader and a seventh grader. And this year has been a year of tremendous change for all of us as we deal with this pandemic. But it's not been the only time I've ever done this. My daughter, when this first happened, I sat down and said, hey, we're going to do these things. And she asked my father about it. My father's a doctor. And if you've never heard of polio season, folks, Google that. Up until 1955, every year, it was just like what we're going through right now. And as I started studying that, and started learning that, I started thinking about where my children are. We've gone through this tremendous amount of e-learning this year. And how effective has the e-learning been? Has there been a study for that? Because I'll tell you what, it's pretty darn efficient. Three days, four hours a day. We managed to get through all the educational requirements for my kids. And we finished, what, three weeks early? Pretty impressive. Was that effective? The reason I'm asking is because this fall, my kids are both at a good time for both um, educational development and social development. Face-to-face -face learning, I'm grateful to hear that you're committed to face-to-face -face learning. I'm also grateful that you guys have taken a lot of steps and outlined what you want to do to help keep them safe. I would, I'm very concerned about how hair trigger is going to be if someone has a headache, someone has a knees, a sore throat, they come in with a cough, are we closing the school? Are we closing a classroom? There's 25 kids in there, how often are we going to close that down? How often will my wife have to take time off from work and she maintain her job? If she has to take time off to work to stay home and be training my kids. So I just ask that be very cautious about triggering that. The impact you have through the whole community, the impact you have for my children, when you're teaching them about fear, about all this is tremendous. So please take that into consideration as you consider how you're going to respond to this particular event. Thank you. Sydney Clifford. graduate of Westfield, and I think all of us graduates think that this is not how we expected the year to go, but we're here right now. Um, and I just want to give a quick perspective from a student on the removal of Dr. McGuire. Her hair was here, oh my god, uh, her hair was big, her heels were high, and her smile was wide. This is my first impression of Dr. McGuire when I shadowed Westfield my eighth grade year. Ever since eighth grade, my first impression of Dr. McGuire grew more into an odd appreciation for a woman who truly has pride and care for each and every one of her students. Dr. McGuire's schedule is packed every weekend because she made it to every single student event. She referred to the WHS student body not as her students, but as her kids. As a principal, she understood us. As a principal, she made us the priority. Most importantly, as a principal, she listened to us. Three years ago to this day, my uncle took his own life. And throughout the rest of that summer, I was distraught. I had one of the biggest reality checks of my life, and my mental health was in disarray. But when I went through those doors at WHS my sophomore year, I had a principal who told me that I had worth and that she loved me. This was one of the turning points in that story. I knew that if the leader of my school was there for me, and all the staff and faculty were too, even during the difficult time. Dr. McGuire has a full set of students. Dr. McGuire understands that change is hard and that the entire high school experience is about change. Right now, our country is in disarray. Racial tension is in an all-time high. A pandemic looms ahead of the foreseeable future. For high school, these moments of change are taking a drastic toll on our mental health. So why are we having to argue about another drastic change in a place they call home? Why do we have to fight for a woman who understands her students, her kids, the most? School board, I urge you to please reconsider your decision 
Christian on the, and reinstate Dr. Guevara's principle of WHS. She understands her students and she will know how to take care of her students, most especially in this uncertain time. Thank you. April Fawcett. Okay, great. 
Good evening to the members of the school board and the superintendent. I'm here as a concerned resident of Westfield and a former student of our schools. At this moment, dismantling a racist system, including racism in our education, as well as maintaining the safety of our students during the pandemic, takes precedence over all issues. But these issues must be met with leadership that can provide love, passion, and stability, as well as understanding and action. And that's why I'm here today to talk about the reassignment of Dr. McGuire as principal of Westfield High School. Now, I recognize that there are some limits to personnel matters that we can't discuss. The law, however, does not limit us from providing you with our feedback and our sincere thoughts, nor does it limit you from considering or acting on our behalf, nor does it limit the discussion of the process in which decisions like these are made. Now, I don't know what your motivations were for this decision, and I probably never will due to confidentiality. So I'll take you at your highest ground with the best of intentions and focus on the effects of your actions that are clearly measurable and visible today. What we hold to be true is this. Dr. McGuire was a beloved and necessary part of Westfield High School. When she was reappointed, the result was shock and confusion by community members, students, and teachers alike. The result was a petition with almost 5,000 signatures demanding that she be reinstated. The result was two rallies held to express our pain, our anger, and to fight on her behalf. On balance, the community wants her back, and at this moment, you must make a choice where you can either listen to us or you can choose to dismiss our concerns. And ultimately, it was con confirmed to me by several of you that it is legally possible for that decision to be reversed and for her to be reinstated instead. Now, multiple speakers today have focused on students as a major point of concern, and absolutely that's true. But I want to also talk about teachers and the educators who've provided us with an education these last 13 years and the four years of the high school. Frankly put, your employees and your colleagues, your teachers, are distraught at this decision. They are asking for their leader back, and your students are also asking for a loving principal. They and the rest of the community want to walk into a school with a leader who promoted, promoted unity, care, and stability. Ultimately, just listening to some of the speeches today, it is incredibly distressing to me that the very teachers who taught me to use my voice and allowed me to use my voice right now aren't able to express their concerns and their right today.
for the love of your students, for the love of your community. Reinstate Stacy Mack. Remove Dr. Britt. Okay, that's all the comments that we have this evening. Our next school board meeting will be August 18th right here at Washington Woods at 7 p.m. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I will second that.